go on and do it now. If you were with us last week, or if you heard the message, we covered the last four verses of Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, in that passage, the author had to interrupt his message, in his message he was giving about the superiority of Jesus' priesthood in order to let the hearers know, let the readers know that he wanted to go on, but he didn't feel like he was ready. They were ready to hear it, to understand it. And the reason being was because of their spiritual immaturity. And, and when we covered those passages, he, he mentioned what the problem was about their spiritual immaturity, what had caused it, and what they needed in order to fix the problem. Well, here this week now, he will go on to say, well, now that you know these things, go on and do it now. If you really want to mature as a believer, and you don't want to be stuck as an immature believer, go on and do it now. And he will get into that. Um, he will give a warning, a challenge, but also some encouragement in these 12 verses. And just as last week, you know, I wanted to challenge all of you to really, you know, see where you're at in your maturity as a believer. This week we'll do the same thing and we'll challenge you to see if, you know, you're going, you're doing it. You're doing the things that are necessary in order to, to mature in your faith. So I hope that this message will speak to you personally. It will speak to us as a church. I know it definitely has spoken to me as I've prepared it all. And, um, and yeah, it's gonna, I really believe that it's going to, possibly change some of your perspectives on things. So before I start reading from Hebrews chapter 6, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us here, Lord, and that you um, have given us life. You've given us, you are a God of second chances, of third chances, of all kinds of chances, Lord. Even though we fall short and we fail, we mess up, Lord, you still love us still care for us. You still want us to get back up and keep walking with you. And we're so grateful and thankful. And we glorify you for your mercy and your love towards us, Lord. Even with our own personal issues or emotional issues or maybe physical issues that we're dealing with, Lord. We know that you are with us. You will be with us for all of eternity. So now, Lord, as we get into this passage, I pray you will speak powerfully to everyone here, Lord, that you will, that your word will go out there on the internet or whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, or any other podcast or it will go out there and, and people's lives will be changed. And those that are here, Lord, I pray that you will also give them a word of encouragement, a, a word of warning, Lord, so that they may turn to you and seek you out. So bless this time, Lord. And use me, Lord, to speak your word boldly and unashamedly right now. Pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And the word of God says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ 
and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual watch, washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. For the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those whom it, whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed. And at the end, will be burned. Stop there and break down what we just read. So again, after having assessed the spiritual condition of his readers in the last four verses of chapter 5, the author here now challenges them to take action about their current spiritual condition. Now, throughout the history of the church, these first eight verses of this chapter have been one of the most difficult passages to interpret. See, there's been a lot of debate as to who it's referring to. Is it referring to Christians? To non-Christians? To both? Well, to answer that question, we must understand that this passage comes in the context of a larger argument which is we should not neglect so great a salvation. You see, instead of maturing in their understanding of, great, of the greater truths of God, many in the church, this church here in particular, were neglecting the great salvation offered in Christ. And as a result... They were stalling out. They, were, they weren't moving forward. They weren't maturing spiritually. Some of them were abandoning the faith and going back to the religion of Judaism with all the works and sacrifices. So he begins in verse 1 by challenging his readers to correct their present course by leaving the elementary teaching about Christ and to go on to maturity. It's important to understand, though, that leaving the elementary teaching of Christ, it doesn't mean leaving Christ behind. That's not what it's saying here. On the basis of knowing the elementary things, Christians should mature to grow rather than settling on infancy or settling for infancy. In other words, these Christians needed to move beyond the foundational things and the old covenant of their former Judaism. See, foundations, church. They're good, and they're necessary for building. But once they've been laid, there's no need to lay them again. There's no need for them to be laid down again. So the author's desire is that they stop laying the same foundation over and over and over again. And so we list six basic principles of the elementary message about Christ that serves as the foundation of the Christian faith and life. Now, these principles 
may be divided into three groups of two each. The first two that he mentions are, uh, well, he mentions first repentance from sinful actions and faith toward God. These two principles are God are Godward, meaning they come from us to God. And they're two sides of conversion that begin in the Christian life. You see, to repent means to change one's mind, to go the other direction. It's not simply a bad feeling about sin. It's not, repentance isn't that feeling you get when you've done something bad and you've been caught. No, it's actually feeling bad about it and wanting to change those things or that thing that you really messed up on. You see, feeling bad about sin it really could be just regret or remorse. Repentance is challenging your mind about sin to the point of wanting to turn from it. Once a sinner has repented, then he is able to exercise faith in God. Thus, as Acts chapter 20 Verse 21 implies repentance and faith, they go hand in hand. The next thing he mentions is ritual washings or here or, or baptism and the laying on of hands. Now, in case you didn't know, while water itself, the water that we baptize you in doesn't cleanse you from your sin in and of itself. The act itself, baptism, is a symbol of spiritual cleansing as well as it identifies us with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you've never been baptized before, this here, baptism, is an important function in your, in your spiritual growth. It's an outward expression of an inward change. The laying of hands symbolize the sharing of some blessing or the setting apart of a person for ministry. These two um, have to do with a person's relationship with the church, with the local assembly of believers. And they're also fundamental components of the church life. And so now the last two that are mentioned are the good news of the resurrection and the prospect of eternal judgment. These two have to do with the future and are also essential components in the gospel that the church preaches, that this church preaches. These two also belong together because the New Testament teaches a resurrection of the saved and also a resurrection of the lost. See, Unless Jesus Christ stands as our advocate, our lawyer, and our substitute, we can't stand before God in the judgment that is coming. And for this reason, the resurrection of the dead, it shouldn't be ignored. It needs to be always something that you think about. The final phrase, verse 3, we will do this if God permits, teaches us not to presume 
upon spiritual opportunities, but to pray to God for our maturation in the faith. By being aware of uh, this awareness, it's going to deepen your dependence on God. Nevertheless, though, this verse reveals that the author believes that his recipients will understand the lesson of what he's saying in these first four verses. You have laid the foundation. You know your ABCs. Now move forward. Now go on and do it. Let God carry you along to maturity. Now, as I mentioned a bit ago, when we began here, these next few verses, verses 4 to 6, have given people cause for worry and concern, mainly because these verses have been, a lot of times, misunderstood and misapplied. Why? Because it focuses on the impossibility of restoring to repentance those who were once enlightened and partook in the goodness and the in the goodness only God can offer. So who are these people who were once enlightened and who tasted this the heavenly gift? Well, there are those who say that Hebrews 6 is talking about people who were never saved, about people who just sort of dabbled in Christianity. They came to church occasionally on Sundays. They had devotions. They went to Bible study, but they really weren't plugged in. They were on the periphery, dabbling in Christianity, dabbling in mysticism, dabbling in materialism, dabbling here and there. Yes, they had a taste of the heavenly gift and of the word, but they never really sank their teeth into it. They never really digested it. Now, if this were the case, and here's the problem, if this were the case, then it would mean that Jesus himself also just merely dabbled in securing our salvation and that he didn't pay the full price. This is far from the truth. Because if you go back to chapter 2, verse 9, we read that Jesus Christ tasted death for all men. This means that he took the poison. He died in our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And it's because of this, because he became sin for us because he tasted death for all men that I can't say that I agree with this position. Now, the second group says that verse 6 presents nothing more than a hypothetical situation. In other words, if there were someone who really experienced the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God, and if uh, and if it, if, if it were possible that they would fall away, then they would re-crucify Christ and put him to open shame. But again, this argument here is really, it's stretching the language. It's really stretching what it's saying here to an illogical conclusion. No. I can't say I agree with that either. I believe verses 4 through 6 isn't about an unbeliever who was never really saved, nor is it presenting a hypothetical situation. I believe that it speaks of those who leave the simplicity of Jesus Christ. So when a person says, oh, Angel, I went back to the party scene for three years, or 
I went back to that religious church that I grew up in or that I got married in or baptized in or that my parents took me to or that I used to belong to. Well, according to what this passage is saying, I'd have to let him or her know or I'd have to say to him or her, it's impossible to renew your salvation. And then I'd remind them of a story in Mark chapter 10 where a young man had everything going for him, rich, young, and powerful. He probably would have been known today as one of People's Magazine's like top five most intriguing people. In a moment of desperation, however, he came to Jesus and said, Good Master, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus listed several of the commandments, which the young man said, I've kept them all. Right, Jesus said. Now go and sell your goods, and you'll be be free to follow me. I can't, said the rich young ruler as he walked away. I tell you the truth, Jesus said sorrowfully, sorrowfully. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom, to enter into the kingdom. Who then can be saved? Asked the disciples, who were under the impression from generations of rabbinical teaching that riches were a sign of God's blessing. If a rich man can't be saved, who can be? And Jesus said, with this man, it's impossible, but, and here is the glorious, but with God, all things are possible. Brother and sister in Christ, have you walked away. You are my brother and sister because you are a believer. I know what it's like to walk away. I've been there. Well, know this. It's impossible in your own energy, in your own strength, by your own efforts to renew yourself again to repentance. Guess what? Here's the thing. Even now, God is doing a miracle. See, He's brought you to this understanding and made you see the stupidity of what you're doing or what you've been doing. And He's done the impossible, He has brought you back once again. But understand that if it weren't for his miraculous power and matchless mercy, it would be impossible for you to return to him. A glorious truth, yet a sobering one as well. For scripture indicates it's possible to wander away once too often. Like the rich young ruler there can, there can come a day when you just won't be able to return, where you just can't. Maybe because the job's too demanding. Those movies are too enticing. That activity is too fun. That guy or gal is everything I ever wanted. Friend, if you're hearing this, if you're watching this, listen carefully. There can come a day when you can wander away to the point where your heart becomes hardened. True, you can't lose your salvation, but you can leave it because God won't force eternal life on anyone. 
what can separate us from the love of God? Well, first, let me tell you what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the fact is this. Only you can separate yourselves from the love of God. And so this ultimately is the warning of these verses. Only you can separate yourself from the love of God. Maybe some of you have done that. I did for a very long time. The Lord brought me back to repentance when I was at the bottom of the barrel, when I had pretty much lost my career, my family. And without telling you the entire story and spending the next half hour sharing that with you, the Lord gave me, I was at a crossroads, I was, gave me a choice. Like, are you going to keep walking in this direction where it's just going to lead to death and destruction? Or are you going to come to me? Angel, it's not hard. I will forgive you. I will heal you. But what about this, Lord? What about that? And don't worry about that. I will heal you. I will make you whole again. I will forgive you. So by faith, again, I rededicated my life and have been walking with the Lord since then. You may or may not have that same opportunity. I know people who have just decided, you know what, I'm just going to live the, my life the way I want to live it. But it's like you tasted good. You've tasted. You've been touched. You've been radically changed you've seen what the lord can do you were enlightened you tasted the heavenly gift and now you just want to keep parting you want to keep sleeping with all those people you really want to live in that dirt in that mire people will say yeah so all i can do now encourage them and tell them God's not done with you God's not done with them so that's what you can do too whenever you are around people who just that have that same attitude I don't want anything to do with God right now okay but he cares for you and he loves you and he still has a plan for you he has these promises for you You will never find anything out there in the world that will ever compare with what Christ has to offer you. Encourage them, love them, and continue to pray for them. Okay, so now to drive his point, drive home his point, he uses an illustration in verses 7 and 8. Whenever rain-soaked ground is productive, it receives the blessing of God. Here the writer compared the spiritual privileges he had just specified to a heavenly rain descending on the life of a Christian. The, the, their effect should be a crop useful for those whom it was farmed, whom it was, uh, uh, whom, well, another, in another translation says, to crop, crop useful to those whom it is farmed. And this perhaps is a reference to the way other Christians benefit from the lives of other fruitful believers. Such productivity 
brings divine blessings on fruitful believers' lives. The crop of God's blessing is called things, is called things that accompany salvation in verse 9. Now true, again, here, not every believer bears the same amount of fruit, but every believer bears the same kind of fruit as proof that he or she is a child of God. This is the fruit of Christian character and conduct that Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 26 says is produced by the Spirit as we mature in Christ. But let's say the land that has received rain is unproductive. It produces thorns and thistles. Yes, God has blessed it in a sense that something was produced, something did come out of the ground. But that which was produced would be worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burned. This metaphor here recalls God's original curse on the ground back in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. And it also suggests that an unproductive, unproductive Christian life falls under the severe condemnation of God and is subject to his burning wrath and judgment. Now, naturally, the reference to burned has, got, has, has caused many to think of hell. But again, if you look at the text as a whole in its context, there's nothing in this text that suggests this. God's, see, God's anger against his failing people in the Old Testament is often linked to the burning of a fire. Even with this, the writer could say, with intense metaphorical effect, our God is a consuming fire. But again, it's talking here about the wrath of God's anger, the wrath of his judgment. Well, the, probably, the author probably knew that these first few, his words here in the beginning of 6, verses one through, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, were probably, they might have been both heavy and solemn. So in the last passage that we're going to be reading, he felt that a word of encouragement was needed. So let's read that now. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. Even though we're speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving, the saints, by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now, we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy, but we will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. In verse 9 here, the author didn't want to leave the readers to believe that he had despaired them, that he had, he didn't want, he didn't want to leave them bummed out. Instead, he tells them that in their case, we are confident of the things, of things that are better. The words these words here that he's saying 
would be similar to something I would say if, let's say, there was some kind of doctrine or teaching that many churches out there were following that was dangerous and dividing a lot of people. And it had, has divided a lot of people. Well, if it was something that I saw that could cause problems here, then him saying this is similar to me saying, but I'm sure that none of you would ever do that. That none of you would, I'm sure that you people would never do that. It's an expression of hope. The better things about which, about which he had confidence were the things that accompany salvation. The writer here insisted that he had every expectation that the readers would persevere to the end and acquire these blessings, even though he felt constrained to warn them against the contrary course. I know, he was, again, he's basically saying, I know this is happening. I know this is the direction that you're going in, but I, I know you can, I, I just know it. I know you can do it. I'm confident that you can. The author knew in verse 10 that God isn't unjust. His readers wouldn't be forsaken. God would remember their work and the love they've shown him in their helping of their fellow believers. And thus he was encouraging them to keep it up while also assuring them that God was conscious. He was well aware of all their aid and available to help them in any needed way. As Christians, we should be able to aid our fellow brother and sister who has a need. Families have been destroyed. Lives have been taken. In many places, the persecution is intense. And so by helping them, you're, you're not only blessing them, but it's a blessing unto you. Here, the author, he's reminding you of uh, what you're doing. And he's encouraging you to keep it up. And he's also assuring you that God is conscious of all the help that you're giving, all the things you're doing to help them in all their needs. Well, finally, in these last two verses, the author wants the reader to know that while it's true that it's God who carries us along to maturity, it's also true that a believer, if you are a believer, you must do your part. You mustn't be lazy, but apply yourselves to the spiritual resources God has given you. You and I, brother and sister, have the promises of God. We should exercise faith and patience and believe that these promises are true and they're for us. Every single promise that the Lord God has made in His Word, in this book, they're for you. They're true and they're for you. Like Caleb and Joshua, we must believe God's promise. And we must go in and believe in those promises. You must believe that those promises work for you, in you, and through you. Hold on to those promises, brothers and sisters. Don't give up. Hold on. 
So what are you saying here? Beautiful things are awaiting you. I want to now take some time here before we have communion to speak to those who are listening and watching. And Maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you walked away from the Lord. Well, today, right now, is the day when you can come back. You haven't walked too far away from the Lord. He's one arm's length away, and he's ready for you to come back, and he's ready to hug you, hold you, and forgive you. Please, before your heart gets any harder, come to him. And if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, and you want to become a child of God, you want to be born again, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And in a minute, I'll be, I'll lead you in a prayer to do that. But I want you to come to the cross. I want you to look and see what Jesus did for you. He was beaten, tortured, crown of thorns put on his head, nails through his hands, Nail, a nail through his feet. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He did that so that you can have eternal life. So you can have that relationship with God that was broken because of sin. There at the cross, all you have to do is ask him for forgiveness. To admit you're a sinner and to ask him to forgive you and he will. He will freely, freely forgive you. He won't ask you to do anything. He won't ask you to, first you got to do this and do that and no. He will freely forgive you. If you want that forgiveness, if you want to be cleansed and you want from all your sins and be given eternal life, wherever you're at, I want you to close your Eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And so now I turn from my sins. I repent and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me powerfully with the Holy Spirit. Fill me over the capacity, Lord, with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my newborn again life. So that others may see you through me so that I may love the way you loved. Thank you again for all you did for me and all you will do for me. I hold on to your promises. I pray this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, I want you to really 
reach out to us and let, it, let us know that you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and that you became born again. I want to hear your story, and if you need help finding a church, we can do that. If you want a Bible, we can send you one. If you need prayer, we can do that. But please reach out to us if you can. If you're here in El Paso, we're in the northeast El Paso in the corner of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. Um, I'm sure you will find a home here where you'll be accepted no matter what you've done or who you are. Thank you for watching this week. I pray you were blessed. Go out there now. Obey him, represent him, be the salt and light wherever you may be. Until next week, goodbye. We love you. I love you. See you next time. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.